Hello, everyone. Today, Michelle and I will give an intro and deep dive of Six Storage, uh, Kubernetes Six Storage. My name is Xing Yang. Uh, I work at VMware in the Cloud Native Storage team. I'm also a co-chair in Six Storage. Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, I'm a software engineer at Google, and I'm a Six Storage tech lead. Here is today's agenda. First, we will talk about who we are and what we did in 1.28 release. And then we'll talk about what we are doing in 1.29 release and what features we are designing and prototyping. And finally, how to get involved. In Six Storage, Sad Ali and myself are co-chairs. Michelle and Yang are tech leads. Other than leads, we also have many members on the Six Storage Slack channel. We have about 30 unique approvers for SIG-owned packages. What we do in Six Storage is defined in our charter. Six Storage is a special interest group that focuses on how to provide storage for containers running in a Kubernetes cluster. The most notable features owned by Six Storage are persistent volume claims, persistent volumes, storage classes, and dynamic provisioning. We also have volume plugins. In addition to persistent volumes that persist the data beyond a pause life cycle, we also have ephemeral volumes, such as secrets, config maps, uh, empty dirts that can be used as a scratch space of a pod that are tied to a pod's life cycle. We also support CSI, Container Storage Interface, that defines a set of common interfaces for a storage vendor to write a plugin so that the underlying storage can be consumed by containers running in Kubernetes and other container orchestration systems. CSI is for block and file, and we also have Cozy, Container Object Storage Interface that provides uh, Kubernetes APIs and the gRPC interfaces to support object storage in Kubernetes. Now let me talk about what we did in 1.28. We have two GA features in 1.28 release. The first one is the reconcile default storage class assignment. This allows an existing unbound PVC that does not have a storage class name set to be updated later to use the new storage, uh, default storage class when that becomes available. The second GA feature is non-graceful no shutdown. This is different from graceful no shutdown. A no shutdown can only be graceful if kubelets can detect it and handle it gracefully. Let's say a user SSH into a node and run a power off command um, that is detected by kubelet. Kubelet uh, depends on system D inhibitor lock mechanism to support graceful no shutdown. And once Kubelet detects that, it will make sure the pods are terminated in a normal fashion. So in this case, the node will be drained, all the resources will be released. However, if the node shuts down unexpectedly because of a hardware failure or kernel panic, in that case, it becomes non-graceful no shutdown because Kubelet cannot detect that and cannot handle it gracefully. Even in the case of a planned no shutdown, well, a user SS, SS, SSH into a node to do a power off command, if that system does not support system D inhibitor lock, then Kubelet still cannot detect that and handle that gracefully. When a non-graceful no shutdown happens, let's say pods are part of a stable set, and those pods will be uh, stuck in terminating status, and they cannot get restarted on another running node. And the volumes also will be uh, still uh, attached to the original node, cannot be detached and reattached to a new node. As a result, your application cannot function properly. That's why we introduced this feature to handle non-graceful node shutdown. To use this feature, uh, you need to apply the out-of-service taint on the shutdown node, 
After that, the pod GC controller will forcefully delete the pods, and the attached detach controller will forcefully detach the volumes, and so that the workloads will move to another running node successfully. This feature was introduced as alpha in 1.24 release, moved to beta in 1.26, and in 1.28 it became GA. We also have features staying in beta where we made some bug fixes in 1.28. The first one is a secure Linux relabeling with mount options. Here we try to mount volumes with the correct secure Linux context to speed up the pod startup time. And the second uh, feature remain in beta is robust volume manager reconstruction. This is a refactor, code refactor of um, um, volume manager. Here we allow Kubelet to provide additional information on how existing volumes are mounted so that we can properly rebuild and clean up after Kubelet restart. We also have other features in 1.28. Recovering from resize failure is a feature that we introduced in 1.23. We have been making enhancements. This feature allows a user to retry volume expansion by specifying a smaller size than the originally requested size so that we have a better chance of uh, being successful. And in 1.28, we also made some additional API changes. And the second uh, alpha feature introduced in 1.28 is PV last phase transition time. In the persistent volume status, now we have a new field uh, which has a timestamp that shows when the PV moved to uh, a new phase. CSM migration is something we have been working on for multiple releases. The core CSM migration feature moved to GA in 1.25, and other cloud providers, including OpenStack Cinder, Azure Disk and File, AWS EBS, GCPD, and vSphere, all moved to GA. Some of the entry plugins uh, are already removed, and others are targeting for code removal. This table shows entry storage driver removal. These storage drivers do not go through CSM migration. GlassDFS entry plugin was removed in 1.26 release, and Ceph, RBD, and Ceph FS, those both are, were deprecated in 1.28 and targeting for code removal in 1.31 release. So that's all I want to cover here. I will um, hand it over to you, Michelle, to talk about what we're working on in 1.29. Great, thank you. Yeah, so we have a lot of uh, exciting things going on in the 129 space. Um, first features that we are promoting to GA. Um, the first one is read, write, once, pod, the persistent volume access mode. And so what this is is actually a new um, it's a new access mode on PVCs called read, write, once, pod that can actually enforce um, access to a volume per pod. Um, this is in distinction from the existing read, write, once volume, which actually allows you to share, uh, have multiple pods share the same volume if they're scheduled to the same node. And so this, this new mode um, makes it more explicit and there's actually enforcement on that. Um, the next feature we're promoting to GA is node expand secret in um, the CSI persistent volume source. And basically this will support um, any CSI drivers that also need to pass in secrets for node expand operations. Uh, then um, f a couple of features that we are promoting to beta in 129. Um, first is the uh, persistent volume last phase transition time. This adds the uh, timestamp to the PV object um, whenever the, the phase changes, and so you can use this if you have any um, sort of monitoring tools um, where you want to um, kind of know when PV states are changing. Um, the next thing um, that we're promoting to beta is um, 
preventing unauthorized volume mode conversion. And so this is a situation where um, today it's possible to create a PVC from a snapshot, but potentially also change the volume mode at the same time um, compared to when you actually took the snapshot. And this potentially has some compatibility issues. Um, certain, con certain drivers won't support um, converting the mode. And so um, what we're doing here in 127 is we're going to prevent um, allowing the volume mode to change when you restore from a snapshot. And um, this is gonna be set by default, but for applications like backup software that might wanna take advantage of this, um, we're still gonna provide an annotation to allow the backup software to, to do this. And then um, the next feature we are promoting to beta, well, it's actually already um, beta today, but um, this is an enhancement we've been working on with SIG app to uh, provide more volume management capabilities into stateful set. And so today when you, you, when you create a stateful set, you can also specify the volume templates and stateful set will create those PVCs automatically, but actually, stateful set won't uh, delete those PVCs when say you delete the stateful set or you scale down the stateful set. And so this new feature is going to um, provide that ability to stateful set. You can set a uh, persistent volume deletion policy. And so you can say now whenever my stateful set is deleted or my stateful set is scaled down, also clean up the PVCs that were created by it. And then, um, uh, in terms of new alpha features, in 129 we are introducing a new feature called modifiable PVCs. And this is gonna give you the capability to modify the PVC after provisioning to, um, to basically change certain properties on the volume, um, including performance properties like IOPS and throughput. And to go into that into more detail, um, we can kind of give an example of what's going to look like. So we're introducing this new concept of a called a volume attributes class. It, it's very similar to storage class, except the main difference is the attributes in that you specify here are supported by the CSI driver um, in terms of being able to modify it post creation. And so you can define, for example, two volume attributes classes, one called silver and one called gold. The silver one will have some lower IOPS number and the gold one will have greater IOPS. And then in your persistent volume claim, you specify you want the silver volume attributes class. And then later on, sometime later, when you, you know, are scaling up your application and you need more IOPS and performance out of it, you can go ahead and change the volume attributes class to gold. And then underneath the covers, we will go and invoke the CSI driver to execute that change on the back end. All right, we're back. All right, so those are all the um, kind of new features that are being introduced or um, have been being promoted. Um, there's also a lot of features that we're currently designing and prototyping right now, and it's under active discussion. Um, first is change block tracking. And so this is a feature where um, it's gonna provide a way to get the uh, differential snapshots between two uh, volume snapshot objects. Um, and so this is very useful for any backup, backup software that wants to do um, incremental backups. And then um, the next feature that we're under that we're designing right now is to support volume expansion for stateful sets. Um, basically, today, if you create PVCs and you want to be able to expand the, the capacity, you need to directly go to the PVC to update that. Um, but here, we're going to add that support to stateful sets, so you can actually change it in the stateful set template, and um, you know have that pass through to the underlying PVCs. Um, another feature that we're under active discussion is storage capacity scoring. And so this is 
basically an en enhancement to the storage capacity tracking feature that we uh, promoted to GA a couple releases ago. But now this is going to add some additional logic into the scheduler to be able to provide preferences for nodes, either um, you know, either kind of preferring a sort of bin pack model where we try to um, you know bin pack all of the PVCs onto fewer number of nodes, or you can specify a spreading preference where you want to try to um, spread all the PVCs evenly across all the nodes. And then the um, last thing that is under active discussion right now is um, figuring out how we can consolidate all of our CSI sidecars um, into a single component. And so I think this is relevant to you if you are writing a CSI driver today um, where we have some like five or six different sidecars that you need to add to your to your plugin. And so um, we're looking at ways of simplifying the maintenance of that and being able to actually consolidate it into one single component. And that will also help simpl simplify our own release processes and be able to um, do more regular patch releases and that kind of thing. All right. So um, those are all the highlights that we wanted to talk to you about today. Um, if any of this sounds interesting to you, um, we are definitely looking for feedback and contributors um, to help with all of these efforts. So if you want to get involved, um, please uh, attend one of our meetings. Um, you can join our Slack channel and our mailing list, and um, we can continue a lot of the discussions there. All right. And yeah, there's a couple more resources for you here. Um, all of these slides will be uploaded with all the links available. Okay, so I think we'll just leave the um, rest of the time for Q and A. Thanks for the talk. Um, with the um, a quick question about the removal of the Gluster driver, and I think the CSI project is kind of like sounded like they were kind of Gluster was kind of moving away from a, a file system. Do you have any recommendations of what open source solution would replace Gluster? Like, what's the natural progression for CSI with uh, like an open source storage solution? I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a bit of a tough situation because. I think it seems like the um, cluster maintainers have decided, you know, not to continue to support Kubernetes with it, and so there isn't really a great alternative. I think I've heard um, there's like a project called Kadalu, I think. Um, they might probably be the best resource for trying to um, kind of have a, a CSI alternative to the main cluster project. And yeah, I would probably reach out to them and, and see. Otherwise, like it, that's if you have to like keep all your existing cluster volumes today and you know you can't migrate to like some other alternative um, storage system. Okay. Thanks. Oh yeah. All right guys. Oh if you is this related to cluster or oh no if you can you um there's a line of people there if you want to cool Yeah hey that was uh, super informative thanks for the talk I was just wondering you know uh with uh AI being so you know important um and data and storage obviously being a really important part of that um if if you all have just uh, kind of thought about sort of what the features would be from your perspective to support um, just a kind of that industry movement. Yeah, that's a very um, interesting question. So uh, if I understand correctly, you're asking about like with um, sort of the 
shift towards AI workloads? Um, what are sort of the AI data problems that we'll want to look at? Yeah. That's, yeah, a much more concise wording of what I was asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely, like, AI workloads do have to consume a lot of data. Um, it's a very, from my understanding, it's a pretty different pattern than what we've traditionally thought of as stateful workloads, like for databases, as an example. Um, my understanding is uh, AI data access is very largely sequential and um, read-only. And so there's a lot of interesting opportunities we can do here. Um, there's also... I think also with AI data, it's also very much uh, parallelizable stuff. Like you have many consumers trying to all read the same data over and over again. And so I think this is where things like um, read only many storage types will, will really um, play a big factor. Um, and so I think we'll see, because with compared to databases, which often use like read write once block storage, um, I think with AI data, I, I largely see a trend where the storage is mostly um, a read-write-many solution um, that can handle con a lot of concurrent readers and can do small files uh, and sequential reads um, in an optimized manner. Um, object storage is also very um, prevalent in AI workloads, and so I think a lot of the... Um, there are like fuse adapters for object storage today. So you can use like a S3 fuse CSI driver or a GCS fuse CSI driver. Um, I think those are all very relevant for the AI, AI um, layer. Hi there, uh, I'm Mohamed, I'm one of the Kubernetes maintainers. Um, I have a question around the CSI, when you move the drivers out of entry. Uh, so how much benefit are we going to see in like testing and CI in particular because testing storage stuff is a little bit tricky? Uh. Yeah, so um, there's a very interesting, it's a little bit of a misunderstanding of like what the CSI migration feature does. Um, the, the CSI migration feature is mainly a way to, prov to allow your existing workloads to continue running without breaking. Um, but CSI migration itself doesn't give you like the new features that CSI has, like snapshots and, and cloning. And so if you actually want to use those features, um, you do actually have to um, convert your existing persistent volumes to the new CSI persistent volume type. And, and so, yeah, the CSI migration feature was mainly a kind of internal um, internal feature that basically pr um, allows your existing workloads to not break when we end up moving all of the cloud provider dependencies out of Kubernetes. Hey, my question is in the context of running Kubernetes locally on premises, not in the cloud, and usage of storage. In your table, the migration table that you showed, I recognized two file systems which are commonly used for, for local, there was CephFS and Gluster, I think. My question is in the direction of plans to include others. Is, I mean, since this is a special interest group, right, we, we can discuss such things. Are there, is there efforts going on in including other local file systems? If not, what can one do to help? What are requirements for, for file systems to be used for local storage? Can I help with uh, adding one more and mm -hmm. how? Yeah, so actually, so the list we were showing, I don't know if you wanna go back to it, um, but the list we were showing was actually um, the built-in Kubernetes uh, storage drivers that were moving out of core Kubernetes. Um, and this is a general trend of just, we want to uh, kind of slim down the core of Kubernetes, just kind of the core kernel part, and keep all the 
specific storage integrations out of Kubernetes, but it doesn't mean that like we're not supporting other storage systems. So it, it just means that in the entry Kubernetes plugins, you won't have these drivers anymore, but all of these things and even more are available through CSI. And so we have over 100 different CSI plugins now, and um, you know it's very easy to extend and, and create your own CSI driver too if whatever storage system you, you are using is not there. So the answer is I need to learn how to write such uh, plugins, you call them. That's right. Okay. And so we have in the one of the last slides, we have links um, to our CSI uh, developer page. And that has things like um, code. Uh, it has a sample CSI driver that you can use. It has a lot of documentation on what all of the CSI calls mean and how you should implement it. And so, but I would also first check the the page here where we have the list of like the hundred different drivers, and you can see if the system you're using is already supported. Michelle and Shang, thank you. Thank you for a a, a good presentation. Uh, just curious to get your opinion on this. So if you really look at, I mean, you guys support both CSI as well as COSI, I think, on your second slide there. Do you have an opinion as to what will potentially take off, you know, two, three, five years down the road? In terms of technology, right? I mean, I know there's a lot of ob object storage out there, and, and there's a lot of backing around CSI. And if you really start thinking about where the future is headed, what, what's your opinion? Nothing dies in the chemistry. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. I think, you know, my answer is it depends. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, I think a lot of it depends on the workloads themselves and, you know, as their requirements change. And so I, I do see one, one interesting trend, which is that there's a lot of um, new, new databases now that are being um, architected to work with object storage yeah. and, and sort of take advantage of sort of the um, cost and um, kind of portability properties that object storage has. And so that is a kind of a trend I'm seeing with a lot of these new databases. Um, they, they also do things like they, you know, use object storage to persist their data, and then they, but they also have like a local cache of some block device to kind of speed up the access. Um, and so that that's kind of an interesting trend that I see um, happening. And probably I'll see, you know. Those are the new databases, but I would expect maybe you know more of the more traditional databases will also start kind of adopting that paradigm. Thank you. Uh, so kind of connected question, I guess. Uh, so how much demand do you see? How much interest do you see with the uh, COSI? Demand for COSI, is that right? Yeah, so how, for, from okay. customers and the and, uh, Mm -hmm. Vendors as well. How, how many contributions so, do you have in, in this space, and how many demand demand do you see for this? So right now we have uh, four cozy drivers. If you, we actually have that updated our readme for cozy, um, so there are definitely vendors participating. Uh, we are actually looking at what is the next phase because it has been alpha since uh, I think it's one point twenty five release. Um, so definitely uh, would like to have more contributors joining that effort, trying to move that to the next stage. Yeah, I think Does that answer your question. <laughs> yeah, I think it's also it's also um, like, you know, if any folks out here are writing operators or you're managing like uh, some sort of stateful workload that uses object storage, um, you know, if you can benefit from having a standardized interface to provision and manage your buckets. Um, I think we definitely want to hear about all the use cases that you have. Yeah, I think that, that so I don't know if it's possible to, if, if anybody here is using COSI today or is interested in COSI as a customer. Okay, cool. 
I, by the way, I'll be glad to talk maybe yeah. later. Like I, I think I largely see it as like if you're doing something that's like multi-cloud or multi-environment, right? And you mm -hmm. want you want to have like a portable yeah. management interface, um, the same way that you can you have the portability of PVCs today. Um, then I think Cozy would be a good fit. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, just question for the uh, plugin removals. Uh, is the plan then overall removing every plugin? I guess more of a question like. For NFS, uh, is there is there a plan in the future to removing that as well? And then you guys recommend just uh, using the CSI NFS plugin then instead, because um, with the I guess what other people are saying that they're migrating away from the Gluster setup, uh, we're gonna replace it with NFS with one of our setups. And I was looking to see if I just utilize the volume plugin for NFS, or just go the route of deploying the NFS CSI, I guess. Yeah. So I think. Um you know, we don't have plans. Right now, we're, the plugins that we're removing is concentrated on like vendor-specific plugins that okay. have to pull in a lot of vendor-specific dependencies into Kubernetes. Um, for generic things like NFS, which is just like part of the Linux kernel, mm -hmm. um, we don't have plans on removing that from the core of Kubernetes. Um, but I would say if you want kind of the, the feature set of the in-tree NFS driver is going to be you know, kind of limited to just mounting existing shares. Okay. But if you want more features like being able to provision NFS shares or even do like snapshots or things like that, then you're going to want to move to the CSI driver. Got it. Thank you. So are you aware there is already a CSI NFS driver? Have you been trying that one? No, we're about to play around with it. So I think I was just seeing like if it's worth deploying and playing, which we will probably end up doing. Uh, but I think for our use case, we just are just going to mount into it. We're not really looking into creating, you know, provisioning new new subpads or volumes. So maybe we'll just go the NFS route. But uh, I, I like playing around with CSI, so I might just do NFS as well. <laughs> the CSI NFS plugin. But yeah, I guess. Thank you. So um, I guess my question would be uh, kind of uh, one theme I've been hearing about uh, is uh, multi-networks, uh, multi-cluster types of stuff, and how storage is kind of planning on following that trend, because that's eventually uh, data has to follow the network wherever that happens. Um, are we considering like uh, replication, like policies that we can add into storage classes and whatnot? Yeah, definitely. I think. Um Multi-network is definitely an interesting problem, and um, trying to figure out how to make like storage replication work uh, is is definitely sort of on the radar. I think one of the interesting challenges is that every storage system kind of does replication its own way, and so trying to figure out a model that works, I think, will be something interesting because the um, basically like. It might be that you have, like a storage system might require you have two different PVC objects in both of the clusters, and then the two PVC objects have the same relationship, some relationship with each other. But then some other storage systems might just want like a single handle kind of covering the whole, um, you know, region of clusters. And so I think that will be some interesting um, discussions we'll be having to, to support that use case. I think in our data protection working group, there was a proposal about replication that we discussed a while ago. Uh, but right now, there is uh, no one is uh, <laughs> actually working on that. But if you are interested, you know, you can join the group and we can discuss that again. Uh, my, my second question is uh, regards to like moving from uh, migrations, uh, data migrations between PVCs types. So if you had one storage vendor over here that you had a PVC class for, and you want to move it over to here. Um, uh, is that like uh, another kind of thing that's in the works or uh, considered or not going to happen? <laughs> is it, um, sorry, was it within the same storage vendor or different storage vendors? Different storage vendors. Different storage vendors. That's a harder problem. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there's, I think there's definitely ways you could do it that are very not efficient. Right, you could just like copy the data, but it's very it'll be very slow. Um, 
I wonder if there's maybe some opportunities for like vendor agnostic snapshots or something that could facilitate that. Uh, I think right now the one way that I know that you can do is just to use a, you can use backup and restore type of approach. And uh, for example, Valaro has this uh, uh, Rastic, but now I think they use Copier. That would be a vendor neutral way of uh, doing a backup and then you can restore it so that you can move it from one to another. And, and it, Rastic supports, um, it, it's vendor neutral. It's format. vendor neutral, is that, yeah. What was that project's name? Uh, I was saying uh, Rastic, or Co actually right now the, the Copia is actually better. So if you look at Valara, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Valara has a way to do that. Uh, the, the new way is uh, it's called a Copia. So it's like a, a file system um, backup. Yeah. yeah. All right. Any other questions? I think we're running out of time. All right. Thank right. you. Thank you.